All right, folks, we are going to go ahead and welcome back Dr. Chris Nichols to the stage. We read through her bio yesterday when she graced us and opened the conference, but uh, the thing that struck me yesterday, because I'd never listened to her in person before, was that A, it was information packed with stuff that I can take home and use in my position with NRCS or as a farmer rancher, but also that she did it in a semi-entertaining way, uh, even, even recognizing that sometimes the things that we say, the truth hurts when, you know, in, when we tell someone in love that they're behaving badly um, and that they should change, kind of like we're doing in this regenerative agriculture movement, um, you know, she's doing it. She's laying the example for us as to, if you're not doing this, you ought to consider it, and here's why. Here's the information and the data that supports that, and we're about to get some more of it. She's speaking my language because there's some visual aids right here. <laughs> well, thank you, Tance. And again, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm going to move this aside a little bit so I don't do my knock too many things over. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here again and um, sort of at the end of the conference. And, and I know, you know, we're we're all anxiously probably looking at the weather a little bit and trying to figure out all of these different types of things. And so one of the things that I wanted to do this afternoon is really talking about the soil health principles and talking about uh, some of the things that I've been working on on trying to create some questions or a decision, decision matrix or decision tool that you could have so that you could go home and make some of these decisions. As I said yesterday, oftentimes we come to these conferences, and, and Rick sort of talked about this a little bit too, as you come to these conferences, you get all really excited, and then you, know, you go home and make a plan, and then you make another plan, and then you make another plan, and then you just go back to the same old plan sometimes. And so how can we get it so that maybe you won't go back to the same, same old plan, but also how can you uh, be able to create this plan? And again, within all of these things, as Rick sort of alluded to, this is very much, I think of this as a very much iterative process, meaning, you know, Rick talked about the fact that he had, what was it, 36 plans or something like that that, that he had created uh, in 2022. There's nothing wrong with that. It's an iterative process. We're, we're all working on trying to learn and move forward and figure out and modify plans as we see responses in the ecosystem. And it's really important to recognize that what we're doing is not creating something that's a static tool that's going to be this way and this is the only way to do things. Regenerative agriculture, one of the things that I really love about it and talk with my, my dad who I mentioned the other day and my family who was here is that within regenerative agriculture, it's almost limitless, the options that you have. You have options and opportunities that are almost limitless. And that's a wonderful thing, but it's also a very scary thing because what do we, how do we start? Where do we go? What are we, what are we choosing? We all need to have a little bit of a plan laid out, but we need to recognize that that can be an iterative plan. It can be continuously changing and modifying depending on what happens. If we have just one static plan we, sit, we stick with and we get lots of rain in the spring or no rain in the spring and the rain in the middle of the summer, how is it that we're gonna be able to deal with all of these different types of things that we're seeing? And one of the other things that I wanna point out in talking about sort of this iterative planning that we have and recognizing sort of the diversity and the fact that we have to keep planning is how little we actually know. So I tell people I'm a soil microbiologist. I went to the University of Minnesota, great school. I love the University of Minnesota. We could all debate about what's the best school out there, but I went to the University of Minnesota as an undergrad. And when I started looking at soil microbiology, they said we knew about 10% of the organisms that were in the soil. Culture them, identify them, we knew what they did. And by the time I finished graduate school at the University of Maryland, uh, we knew about 0.1% of the organisms that are in the soil. And that number keeps going down. So basically, my dad helped me go through 12 years of higher education for me to become 100 times stupider than the day I walked in the door. <laughs> and I admit this to myself on an almost daily basis that I wake up in the morning and I come to conferences like this and I recognize that by the time I leave here, 
when I came here, I'm, I'm going to leave here about 100 times stupider than when I walked in the door because there is so much more to learn. So I wonder sometimes why these people invite me to come and speak because I admit to you that I'm just basically stupid. But that is part of the things that I think we have to recognize in regenerative agriculture is take a step back from our hubris, take a step back from thinking that we know everything and really recognizing the soil as the context. And that was what I was trying to talk about yesterday is taking the soil as the first thing that you think about in your decision tool. I think of the plants and the animals, and I get in trouble with uh, ranchers a lot with this because I say the animal, the cow, or whatever grazing animal you have, whatever animal you have is just a tool. It's just a tool. The plant's a tool, the animal's a tool, same as your you know, combine, whatever it is, it's a tool. And tools can be used to do, we can modify the way we're using the tools to address the issues that we have. So when we're going through and talking about this decision matrix and how we're gonna put some of these things together, I want you to be thinking about those different tools that we have and the way to use the plants and the animals and everything that is macroscopic to microscopic, utilizing those things as tools to help to regenerate soil. I said yesterday that what we're doing in regenerative agriculture is really soil regeneration via recarbonization. And when I think of regenerative agriculture, this is sort of the definition of regenerative agriculture that I kind of like using. And it's a systems approach. That's the first thing that we need to think about. But it is a systems approach that is dynamic, innovative, integrated, and intensive. And each of those words has meaning by itself as well as meaning and how it works together. So I presented some slides yesterday talking about consortia activity. Everything that we're doing has consortia activity and consortia impact. It's all about intermeshing and interweaving. And we're going to do this by, again, focusing on photosynthesis or the carbon flow or the carbon costs. I was talking to my dad over lunch, and he was talking about Rick's presentation and, you know, the comment about how much nutrients you can gain in your cover crop. And my dad was like, well, but nothing is free. And I said, that isn't free. There is a cost to that. You know, one, you have the cost of the seed and you have the cost of, of your time and the cost of tools to plant it and maintenance that you're doing on it, all of those things that are going to be costs. But the other part of the costs is the costs of carbon. Nothing is free. Carbon has to be used through root exudates to pay for those nutrients from the soil. And carbon that gets allocated below ground is carbon that's not going to be available to be allocated above ground. That doesn't mean that you're automatically going to see a yield loss. But what it does mean is that we have to recognize how carbon is flowing through our system. And if we can get the plant to maximize efficiencies to increase its photosynthetic rate, the carbon that allocates, is allocated above ground to the grain and the carbon that is allocated below ground can be balanced out so that you don't see a loss. But oftentimes producers will worry about going into regenerative practices because they feel like there's going to be a yield loss. And that is where we have to be looking and exploring and thinking about this allocation equation. And we can't think about it in if you do lose a little bit of yield, what is it that you're gaining below ground? And how is it that you can utilize that going forward? We focus a lot on short-term gains, but that gives us long-term losses. What I want to do is us focus on short-term balances to give us long-term gains. And notice I didn't say short-term losses, but short-term balances. Because this is, as Rick was talking about, this isn't about just your productivity and just your yield. 
I mentioned yesterday that I feel that the word that has done the most harm to agriculture is the Y word. Because if that's the only thing you're looking at, carbon allocation and carbon flow is just going to above ground. If that's your focus, if that's your context, you're not going to get a system that's going to move forward and going to be profitable for you in the end. Notice that $2 million that Rick talked about this morning wasn't about his yield. It was about the savings that he could have from the things that he was doing. Reduction in diesel fuel, reduction in inputs. All of these things do have a cost. And what we're looking for is how we're going to manage these trade-offs. Again, nothing is free in this whole entire system, but if our focus is on how we can use the most efficient form of solar energy conversion to chemical energy via the bonds between carbon atoms and carbon atoms and other atoms. The sun, sunlight is free. And when I talked about 280 days minimum, I want to emphasize the minimum again, 280 days minimum. I do know where I am. I am a South Dakota kid originally. I was born in Millbank. My dad, as I said, purchased the farm, southwestern Minnesota, just west of uh, Lake Benton on Highway 14 is where that farm is. And he purchased it the year I was born. So I've been here my whole entire life. I know where I am. 280 days minimum. Because guess what? It shines 365. If our bottom line to being profitable in our agro ecosystems is founded in regenerating soil via recarbonization, and carbonization only happens through photosynthesis, if you're only capturing sunlight for 280 days, you're taking 85 days of vacation. That's a really long vacation. I'm not really sure if you deserve it. <laughs> Again, equal opportunity offender. <laughs> what we need to do is maximize the amount of sunlight we can capture. And there are studies that do show that even under snow, you can get green plants that will still do photosynthesis. Again, I've lived here all of my life, and we have things like the Chinook winds that come in and warm it up. And now I currently live in Alberta, and I know where the Chinooks come from, because I live in, the Chinook, in Chinook country. I know where the Chinooks come from. But what this does is it's a warming that happens, and we can utilize that when we have something like a rye cover crop or something that doesn't do, that will be not winter killed easily. Canola and turnips and radishes, these plants that are going to be able to respond even when you've had a period of frost. So when I'm talking about 280 days, I'm not saying it has to be 280 days frost free consecutively. It's about plants that are gonna tolerate frost so we have to be choosing the plants that go into our cover crops well, and that's part of what happens with the tool that the Midwest Cover Crop Council has, and part of the tool and, and things like that that Green Cover Seed in the back of the room is also using. We need to be thinking about, again, if you think about what I, my job is, is to recarbonize the soil and get plants growing as many days as possible, 280 days won't seem unachievable to you It'll seem lame and like too little because it is that we have these options and opportunities to really be regenerating our systems. And so I wanted to talk about this a little bit. We've got soil health principles. And soil health principles, I have uh, six of them. I know, you know, we kind of vary, in, but most of them are pretty much the same. Um, and what we're trying to do with looking at these soil health principles is eco-functional intensification, a systems context that we're using 
And so what I want you to be thinking about, when we think about and we talk about all of these things that we can do, putting in pollinator strips, putting in areas in which we could create insectaries for beneficial insects, all of these things, think about your entire farmscape. This just isn't about the fields that you are growing your crops in or your pasture, your various paddocks that you have there. What this is, is about every square foot in your farmscape, how is it that I could manage that for its best eco-function? If I've got a tree row, what could I put into that tree row? Pollinators, pollinator plants. Increase the amount of birds and bats and bees. Put up bird houses and bat houses. I've worked on projects where we installed, we did monitoring of how the bats were flying and we would install bat houses strategically so we would get them to fly over our crop fields. Do you know that bats help to pollinate corn? That pollinators, more of the pollen in the pollinator guts comes from grass species than it does from what we think of as pollinator plants, flowering plants. There's more pollen from grass species in the guts. Jonathan Lundgren at uh, Blue Dasher Farm has taken a look at this. So we know how incredibly important these organisms are to our system. So instead of having to say, oh, you know what, I have to take this out of production and that's gonna cost me and I can't do this here, why don't you look at your entire farmscape and figure out what it would be that you, how you could utilize that for its best eco-function to help to add functionality to the system. I worked on a study where we were looking at a plant a predatory insect, and so a plant pest insect, and what we did was we would have strips that basically created sort of a box around our crop field that we had plants that would attract those predators to go to those plants first. So early on in the season, they would go to those plants first, and that's where they would lay their young, and their young would know that this was home. So they wouldn't go very far into the crop field. And then we put another strip around inside that one strip that had those plants that would attract the predators. We put another strip around that would actually attract predatory insects that would kill those predators. Is this something that we can look at doing in our fence rows and in our ditches? How is it that we could look at managing our farmscape different to achieve the eco-functionality that we're looking for without having to take everything out of production? It's a not an all or nothing type of a situation. So I wanna zero in a little bit more on these six soil health principles. And I put these six soil health principles in this pyramid design. I know it looks kind of like a triangle, but it's supposed to be a 3D pyramid. And the idea behind this is not about hierarchy. Armor is no more important than managing inputs. Managing photosynthesis is no more important than managing soil disturbance. The reason that I put this in a pyramid design, again, is not about hierarchy, but if you think about pyramids, pyramids have stood for thousands of years. Because of the architecture where every block was important in the pyramid, to helping to support the structure of all of the blocks around it, below it, on top of it, and to every side. And that's what it is that we're trying to do, is create a strategic architecture within our agroecosystems that's going to allow for them to stand for thousands of years. 
I don't just want my family to celebrate Century Farm. I want my family to celebrate Millennial Farm. You do the most important job on the planet. I emphasized yesterday that we are all carbon-based. Every cell, every molecule is carbon-based, and that carbon comes from food, from you. So what you're doing, we cannot have civilization without having that in the system. What you're doing is essential to getting this to work. So when we're taking these apart, you know, we talked about maximizing photosynthesis via the number of growing days. Increasing the number of days in which you have something growing. Not just having more things in one day, but having them more often. And here's why. As Rick mentioned, in a heaping teaspoon of healthy soil, you can have more microorganisms than the number of people on planet Earth. And they are all hungry. They want some food. And they don't want to go through feast and famine periods. They don't understand that if there's a famine period, there could be a feast period following it. Their growth is based on having a consistent food source. So when you take your 85-day vacation, that is a starvation period for the microbial community. And yes, it may be cold out there and it may be cold in the soil, but we know there was research that was done in Grand Forks, North Dakota, where we were looking in a potato field, so not really any residue cover, which could help to insulate and reduce the amount of frost that you have in the soil, without any cover on it, in a potato field in Grand Forks, was measuring microbial activity in the dead of winter. So we know that something is growing there, because what they do is they engineer a habitat for them to survive, and that habitat is going to shelter them from these extremes in temperature and water. They create soil aggregates. That's their habitat. And you can have different levels of oxygen and CO2 and water and temperature throughout that aggregate. Because these are microscopic organisms. And if they can create a microscopic environment that can allow them to thrive during the winter time, even in Grand Forks, North Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Aberdeen, South Dakota, wherever it is that you are, they will survive. But the more important thing to their survival, they engineered a way to survive the day changing conditions but they can engineer a way to survive without food. So making sure that we are feeding them is the most important job that you have. Now we've also talked and several people have talked about diversity. And I think diversity on multiple scales, on multiple trophic levels from microscopic to macroscopic. I don't just want to have one of those 10% of those microbes that I knew at my undergrad, what it did and I could grow it and culture it. I know that there are millions more of them than I need to have in the system. And driving the diversity above ground is gonna help me to drive the number of days that I've got something growing. They automatically fit together like the stones in the pyramid the blocks to hold that all together. Now, I'm gonna skip this one for a minute. I'm gonna go up here to livestock. Managing micro and macroscopic livestock. Livestock are incredibly important to this system. Again, it doesn't mean that you need to have a grazing animal. Grazing animals can help to accelerate things, but if you don't have one, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna go anywhere. What we're looking for when we're talking about what livestock does is livestock adds stressors to the plant. Grazing, wounding the plant leaf 
is an injury. It's a stressor to the plant. The plant's response to stressors, especially something that wounds its tissue, is that the plant has to create biomolecules to wall that off. Creates antioxidants and polyphenolics. Antioxidants are stress biomolecules. They're part of the wall structure. What they normally do in plant cell walls themselves is they help to make sure that the plants are not destroyed very quickly by solar radiation. The plants need sunlight, but sunlight is also killing them, just like us. So we need to make sure they have these antioxidants as part of their cell wall structure so that the sunlight, that solar radiation, gets buffered and doesn't kill them as quickly. When the cells are injured, the plant has to produce more antioxidants to break up that injury. So when grazing happens, that injury can stimulate the plant to actually give more carbon below ground because to make the antioxidants and the polyphenolics and the other proteins that the plant needs to make now, it needs to get resources from the soil. Those molecules aren't just carbon and hydrogen and oxygen that the plant has via photosynthesis. Those molecules contain nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and copper and zinc and molybdenum. All of these other elements that are needed in response to that stress. And the only way the plant knows how to get them when that injury occurs is if some numb schmuck gives it to them for free or if they pay some of the photosynthate that they have, some of that carbon, to the microbial community for the microbes to go out there and get it for them. And so what we want in managing livestock is to manage the stress on the plants. We want them to be stressed so that they give more exudates out through the soil, but we don't want them to be so overstressed that they can't do photosynthesis, which is why we talk a lot about eat half, graze half, leave half. We talk about these other ways in which we should manage to keep enough solar cells there to keep the plants active and able to provide this. Now the other thing when you're looking at this injury, one of the things that I did one day, I was waiting on someone and I happened to be at, the, at a research farm where we had a bunch of animals and on that day, they all happened to be grazing in a, in a very close area. So we had chickens, and we had sheep, and we had cattle, and we had horses, and they were all not too far from each other. So while I was waiting, I just kind of took a, round, a walk around the farm, and I started filming these animals. I would sit for a while at each paddock, and I would film the animals. And film it and think about, and I would watch those films and watch how the animals are grazing, how the animals are managing the stresses on the plants. And one of the things that I found was really interesting was when you looked at cattle versus sheep and horses, the cattle, what they do is they don't use their teeth. They take their tongue and they sort of wrap it around the forage, and then they use their head and pull and tug. And in that process, what they'll do is that pulling and tugging will sometimes pull up the plant and pull up part of the roots, but more often than not, it pulls and tugs at those roots and it'll rip off root hairs. And so the roots now, without the root hairs on there with that breakage, will leak sugars, will leak exudates. And on top of that, the way that they are treating the leaves as opposed to a slicing action that happened with sheep and with horses that use their teeth, or if we go out there and hay and slice, what they're doing is they're shredding the leaves. 
and they're putting a lot more wounds on each leaf than the slicing action would do. This has frustrated rangeland scientists for decades. Because what we do as rangeland scientists is we can't figure out how we can control, do a controlled experiment to mimic what cattle do. Tried for decades, tried to figure it out. We send armies of students out into rangeland, trying to pretend like they're cows. Go out there, trample stuff around, we're gonna use rakes, we're gonna use, but no one ever thought, I don't think, about looking at how the leaves are damaged. We'll hay it, we'll cut it, we'll cut it here, we'll cut it there, we'll cut it there, we'll cut it up here. We'll... Somehow this has got to do this. And it wasn't working because we didn't think about that impact that the plant physiology has to go through when it is that we're grazing. Which means that you can, it doesn't mean that we all have to have cattle or bison, but it does mean that if you have another animal in the system, you don't graze them the same way as you would the cattle or the bison. Because you want to control that impact a little bit differently in how it is that we're going to be managing that system. So we've got looking at how we're going to manage livestock, reducing soil disturbance. I have tillage up there, but I'm referring to it more as soil disturbance. This doesn't mean that you can't have some sort of soil disturbance. Rick was talking about how he had to till. There were probably some other alternatives, and Rick and I can talk about maybe some of the other alternatives, and I think he recognizes where some of the other alternatives are, but sometimes we're going to do something in the system, in the way that we're managing it, the tools that we choose that in some cases aren't always going to just be adding carbon. Because that's what you want to do when you're thinking about the tools that you choose. Is this adding carbon to my system or is it taking carbon away? The reality of agriculture is that agriculture is an unnatural act. We are asking our plants and our animals to perform at a level that they naturally would not want to do. And so in order to be able to do that, we are going to make some choices sometimes that are going to take some carbon away. But what we want is we want more steps or bigger steps putting carbon back in so that we always have forward momentum. And I think that this becomes one of the things within regenerative agriculture that it's like, I don't want to do the wrong thing. The worst thing that you can do, the most wrong thing that you can do is nothing. I love my dad. My dad is not anywhere near where I'd like him to be. Somebody came up to me the other day and said it last night and was like, God, if she can't do it for her dad, how can I possibly do it for mine? And I get it. I've been a farmer's daughter all my life. You all are stubborn and stupid and annoying and you really just don't want to listen to me. I don't understand it. And especially if I'm your daughter. When I worked up in North Dakota, so started on this journey about 20 years ago, I worked up in North Dakota and I strategically planned, my dad was going to come up, my family was going to come up for a visit. I strategically planned it around one of Burley County's field days. And I took my dad to the field day. And he talked to Gabe Brown and Kenny Miller and Jay Fear and all of these guys. And literally, this was it. We're in the car driving back to my house. I lived in, in Bismarck at the time. We're in the car driving back to my house. My dad turns to me and he says, I think I'm going to get cover crops so you can grow cover crops. Really? <laughs> Who told you that? Who said that was a good idea? <laughs> and literally, two weeks later, 
I had to stop by Gabe's place and pick up a couple bags of cover crop seed and drive them home. Because <laughs> that's what I was good for. <laughs> so what we need to do again is stop ourselves from doing nothing. He's not anywhere near where I want him to be. I also know that he's not going to probably get all the way to where I want him to be. I have really high hopes for my nephew. So he's the one that we're, we're focusing in on now. He's going to get everywhere because that's how it is that's going to happen. And that's okay. It's perfectly fine. He's done a lot of really good things. He's stopped fault tillage. He keeps thinking about crop rotation. He keeps thinking about organic matter. He's come a really long ways, honestly. But we need to not let our fear of doing something wrong paralyze us into doing nothing. So again, when we're talking about soil disturbance and tillage, we also need to think about the fact that soil does need some level of disturbance. It always has. We've had animals that came through and disturbed the soil. We've had wind and water that have come through and disturbed the soil. And snow. All of these things are things that are disturbing the soil. So we can't tell ourselves, I am never going to disturb the soil and it's never going to happen and it's just going to sit there. Sometimes we do need to do some level of disturbance. Doesn't mean that we need to get out the moldboard plow and plow it up. We need to think about how we can manage disturbance to achieve what it is that we want to achieve. Sometimes the system needs a little bit of a reset. Sometimes we need to do these things that we wouldn't really want to do. And that's okay. Armor and protection. I think this is incredibly important too when it is that we're thinking about our systems. We want to make sure when from the soil context that that soil is protected. I talked about the fact that the microbial community will engineer a way to make sure that it can moderate the impact against temperature and moisture and gases. One of the best armors that we can have is a living plant. So Dan showed a picture earlier, for those of you who were still in this room during the breakout, of temperature probe. And temperature probe was in bare soil, and a temperature probe was under cover crop. And there was about a 20 degree temperature difference. When he had another one that was under some residue, and it was about 100 degrees, and again, it was about a 25 degree temperature difference that you would have there. But what we would like more often than not than having dead material be our armor, living material is going to be a better armor. Because living material, living tissue is going to be a, do a better job of being able to absorb the energy from the impact of raindrops, the energy from wind, and the energy from the sun is going to be better absorbed in living tissue than in dead tissue. Because in dead tissue, there's only so many molecules left to be able to do that absorption. You don't have as much redundancy and resiliency that you do within living tissue. The other thing, and Rick talked about this with the stomata, the other thing under living plants is that you've got the stomata that are going to be opening and closing, but opening, when they open, they want to take in CO2, but they're also giving off water vapor at that time. And what they're using when doing that process is not just to take in the CO2, but also to do evaporative cooling. That water vapor is keeping that environment underneath those leaves cooler. We sit under shade trees. 
not just because it blocks out the sunlight, but we also get and get to take advantage of that evaporative cooling. So when you sit under a shade tree where the shade is really high up, it's not as cool. You're still in that much shade, but it's not as cool as if you're sitting under a tree where the branches are lower down and closer to you. And that is because of that evaporative cooling. So we need to be thinking about some of these things a little bit different in how this is happening. So I said I was going to come back to this one. So this one is sort of the sixth soil health principle. And I've asked NRCS multiple times, pe people further up the food chain than you, Tans, about why we won't include this in the soil health principles. And there are multiple reasons why we won't talk about this, but this is managing your inputs. Fertilizer and pesticides. Managing your inputs. And I said yesterday that part of the reason why we want to do this is because the microbial community, directly or indirectly, Almost every organism that's in the soil is involved in nutrient cycling or pest and disease management. And if some dumb schmuck comes along and takes care of that for the plant, the plant is not going to pay the microbial community. So their job is now outsourced. And we all know what happens to a community when the jobs start to get outsourced. The more and more jobs that get outsourced, the more and more that community is going to collapse. Every organism, including us, functions very much the same way. Again, we all work for food. If we don't get paid, we don't eat, we don't replicate, we die. That's the process. So what we're trying to do here is keep that microbial community growing soil regenerating that environment, we need to keep the jobs. And part of keeping the jobs is also helping to add some stressors. So another way that I like to think about the principles of soil health is that we need to treat the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves. To be healthy human beings, we are supposed to eat small meals throughout the day. We are supposed to be grazers. Now, I know that there's, there are some people who do intermittent fasting instead of grazing all the time. But for the microbial community, like I said, unlike us, we know when the fasting is going to end. The microbial community during the 85-day vacation has no idea if it's going to be 85 days or 365 days. It doesn't know that. You can't tell it that. Just relax for 85 days. You'll be fine. It's over the winter. Take a vacation. Kick back. Go into a resting stage. You're good. It has no idea. So what we need to do is we need to be consistent in what we're feeding that community. We want to make sure that that community has a diverse diet so that we have representatives from all of the millions of different species of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes and microscopic insects. All of those things need to be present. And many of them eat different food so that they can do slightly different jobs. Plant says, I need copper today. It gives off exudates in a form that's going to stimulate the community that can help to release copper. Exercise. Exercise, but don't over-exercise. Don't exercise to injury. We want our soils, as I said, to perform like gold medal winning Olympic athletes. You stress them, but you don't stress to injury. We still need that level of performance. 
So if they're a little bit nutrient stressed or a little bit water stressed, or God forbid there's a bug out there, or seriously, Dad, God forbid there's a weed, and you can't row your crops as you're driving down the highway and the neighbors are going to call you up and wonder what, what it is are you doing, James? Come on. <laughs> if that happens, that's a little bit of stress, and that can be okay. But again, you don't want to stress to injury. Manage the system to make sure that that doesn't cause you a lot of harm. We're going to talk in a minute about this FIST, the Frequency, Intensity, Scale, and Timing. Because I think that that will provide us with a platform for choosing how it is that we are going to create decision tools. And the other thing here is to protect your body from injury or radiation. That is that armor. That is that living cover crop. That is that crop residue. Same way that we need to protect ourselves, we need to protect our soils. So one of the things that happens when it is, and we've talked, several speakers have talked a lot, and Elaine talked just a minute ago about soil aggregation and aggregate stability. And one of my favorite things, because I got to deal with my dad, and when I have to deal with my dad, I got to figure out how to explain things to him and how he could maybe figure out how to see some of these things for himself. So one of the things that I've done is I went around Alberta, whole entire province, and worked with producers in a workshop where we, they each created these little sieves. And I have some of these that um, I'm going to give to a few people with the uh, South Dakota Soil Health Coalition so that maybe this can get spread around. They're very easy to make. It's just pieces of PVC pipe or vacuum pipe and mesh screens. And what you can do with this, this is a smaller mesh screen. It's about, it has about a one millimeter opening. I know you can't see it and I'm holding it up to you like, yeah, I can see that one millimeter opening there. <laughs> so it has about a one millimeter opening and this is a screen that has about a two millimeter opening. And this is similar to standard window screens. And this screen here is a screen that is for um, small insects. Or if you go, so you can go in the hardware store and you can find this usually in the camping aisle for your campers or things like that for gnats. So it's a small insect screening or in Canada we call it no So we've got no screen and we got regular window screening. And all that you have to do is take soil, take about a, a tablespoonful of soil, put that on top of the two millimeter screen, standard window screen, shake that, collect what comes through, take what comes through and put that on the one millimeter screen and shake that. And then what stays on the screen are one to two millimeter aggregates. And one to two millimeter aggregates are some of the sweet spots for aggregates because one to two millimeter aggregates are aggregates that are more formed by biological processes than they are formed by chemical processes or physical processes. So when we're wanting to see the biological effect on our soil, separating out one to two millimeter aggregates, and then you put those in a, you can put them in a cup or a dish or anything you want with some water. And you'll see the aggregates will either stay together or the aggregates will fall apart similar to the clods that Elaine showed, or you probably have seen with the slate test or the clod test where you take that and you put it on a mesh screen. But with the aggregates, we're really getting down to what the microbial community is doing, more so than what you would see if you were looking at it in just those large clods. So when we get good aggregates and good aggregate structure, that's gonna help us to improve porosity. So one of the other things that I wanna do really quick is I need four volunteers. Don't everybody rush the stage at once. Come on, we can do it. All right, and come on up. And I'm gonna give you that, I'm gonna give Dennis this, and 
I have. And basically what I have here, it's gonna look like really dirty water, but I'm gonna pour this in here. And what we wanna do is one of these sponges is not like the other. Basically what we've got is we've got one sponge that's gonna mimic a porous soil and one sponge that's gonna mimic a more compacted soil. And we can pick up the sponge and flip it over and see what happens. <laughs> so what I want you to do, we're gonna have Sean and come over on the other side and I apologize, I don't know your name, sir. Can't yeah. see your, Scott. Okay, and David is gonna be here with Dennis. And what I want you to do is I want you to pick up the sponge and I want you to just hold it above the cup. Don't squeeze, just hold. So the water that's coming out at this point in time is what's called gravitational water. When you have a very, very porous soil with very large pores, this is the water that can percolate out of the soil profile and might not necessarily be available to the roots because it's gonna be going deeper. Gravity is constantly trying to pull the water out of the profile and evaporation is trying to pull it, sun is trying to pull it out from the surface. And that's where you would lose that gravitational water. Now, I'm gonna trade you. Well, if you wanna split with Dennis, there, I'll take these. And then what I want you to do is I want you to now squeeze into the other cup. So this is illustrating your water holding capacity. So I tried to add a little bit of coffee to this so you could see it a little bit better, but can't see it too much. Come on, David, you can do better than that. I know you can. <laughs> so what we have here is the power, illustrating the power of porosity in our soils. So Sean and Scott, this was with our more porous soil. If you wanna hold the cups up so people can see them a little more. We lost some water to gravitational flow, but we still have a whole lot of water held in our pore space. And Dennis, how much water did you have in your pore space? Uh, <laughs> pretty little. Pretty little. And we lost some water, again, to gravitational flow but if we don't get good infiltration rate, which was what you have happen oftentimes, you won't have any water that you would lose to gravitational flow because there wouldn't be any infiltration. The water wouldn't get into the soil at all. So I wanna thank you, gentlemen. Less than a cc. Less than a cc, there we go. We got, it. We got an accurate measurement from Dennis. I thought for sure we were getting vodka. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, gentlemen. So again, something really easy for you to do, I like to do this with kids a lot of times, to sort of demonstrate the idea and let somebody know why it is that you want to get porosity in your soil. What is it that you're getting with doing these types of improvements to the system and creating more soil aggregates? So I know we're getting a little bit low on time, but I want to talk a little bit about, again, how you could go about making decisions on what of all of these infinite, limitless options and opportunities you have for choosing tools. And one of the first things that you want to think about is not, should I do this? Should I no-till? Should I plant a cover crop? But why? Because asking yourself why is going to help you to determine what tools you could use to be able to address an issue that you're trying to address. To be able to make the decision you're making. And why? So that you don't necessarily have to make the same decision on every field that you have, but maybe on a few fields. Maybe in this spot on your field. I'm doing this for this reason. Why? Not I should. Because, you know, my neighbors are going to drive by and wonder why they can't row my crops, that there's weeds in the middle of them. That's a should. 
That's not a why. So then how? What are the practices or tools that you could use to achieve that why? What are the consequences of using those tools or practices? When is it going to be most effective or have the least negative consequence? If you have to choose a tool that may be slightly destructive, choosing tillage, or I like to use animals, again, because they're tools, they can be my soil disturber. If I'm in an organic no-till situation and I have a particular weed that I want to get rid of, I'm going to put the animals in, get the fence, split very, very tightly so they're shoulder to shoulder and are going to run in and have enough hoof traffic in that area where that weed is in its highest concentration. I need to do a little bit of disturbance. I need to reset my soil a little bit. I don't want to use tillage. Take the animal out there in a high density. You don't have to leave them out there. Run them through. Their hooves are a tool. Use them as a tool. So when is it going to be most effective or least negative? If I'm going to be using a tool to do soil disturbance, I don't want to use that tool when my microbial community is growing the fastest, when it's at its peak growth rates. Because that is going to be more destructive than if I use the tool at another time. Where? Do I have to do this in my whole entire field? If I have a weed issue, is that weed an issue through the whole entire field or the whole entire pasture or the whole entire paddock? No. They pick spots. That's the spot I'm going to deal with. I don't have the time or the energy or the desire to do something on 100 acres that I could do on 5 or 10. So why do we think that we should do this in the whole entire field? Choosing your tools effectively to be able to address the issues that you're trying to address. Utilizing this, when you're thinking about the tools, you have chemical, physical, and biological options of tools to choose from. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about this fist. It's about the system, not the tools and practices. But we choose the tools in how they're going to fit, or the practices in how they fit within the system. And one of the things we can think about, again, in addressing those questions that I had in the previous slide, is the FIST acronym, frequency. If I use this tool, is that going to mean that I'm going to have to use that tool more frequently or less frequently? And frequency, more frequent, doesn't always mean that it's a bad thing. So, for example, if you use a tool for adding nutrients to soil, but you split applications, you're going to be using that tool, split application of applying a fertilizer, more frequently. Because you split applications. I'm going to use this in order to be able to do this more frequently. But I'm going to time it, timing, to when it's going to be most effective when the plant needs it. The plant needs it as it's going into the reproductive phase. It's when the plant's going to have its highest nutrient demand. Why can't I add nutrients then? What tools do I need to do to be able to do that? That's going to increase the frequency of how often I'm going to be adding nutrients because I want to add some nutrients when, the, when I plant the seed. But then I need to add nutrients again later on. Thinking about frequency and timing. Again, frequency, more frequent doesn't always mean bad, and less frequent doesn't always mean good. It's not about bad or good. It's about looking at how the tools, the consequences of the tools that you're using. Intensity. We're thinking about intensity, it is how much force is being applied in the use of this tool. 
Rick talked about the fact that he cuts back, he's been able to cut back on horsepower. High horsepower is greater intensity. It's a greater level of force. Sometimes I may need that level of intensity to deal with an issue. Sometimes I need something a little bit less intense. Sometimes I need to have more organic nutrients. Intensity in the scale of nutrients can be about how readily available those nutrients could be. Sometimes I want them to be in the organic form so that they're released over time via de decomposition. I don't want that intensity of one flush of nutrients available. Sometimes I do. Maybe I do. Thinking about through what might be happening. The scale, how much of one particular thing. The quantity, quantity of nutrients. The quantity of soil that using a moldboard plow disturbs versus maybe using a disc. And again, in thinking about the quantity of soil, it's about the whole volume of soil. It's not just what you invert, but it's also about the whole volume of soil that you've disturbed in this process. So thinking about the scale of things. And again, thinking about timing. When should I plant my cover crops? When is it going to be best for the soil? And when is it going to work within the system that I have? Can I go out there and plant a crop before in my soybean field, broadcast something right before it senesces and the leaves drop so that I can get that seed underneath the leaves? That gives me seed to soil contact. I, bro I broadcast it out there, but I now have something covering. The idea of seed to soil contact is more about protecting that seed from solar radiation than actually getting it into the soil. Because the seed, when it's germinating, can't use the nutrients and the microbes that are in the soil. It uses the resources that are in the seed. Every germination test that has ever been done by every seed company out there that they tell you what the germination rate is, they never do that in soil. Never, ever, have they ever done it in soil. Germination tests are done by taking seeds, counting the number of seeds you have, or doing it by the weight of the seeds that you have, spreading them out, on a layer of wet paper towels and putting a layer of wet paper towels on top of that and putting them in a drawer. If the seeds are going to germinate there, the seeds are going to germinate under the leaves that fell from your soybeans. It's not just about where it is that we're putting things but it's about how the physiology operates, what's happening within that system. So again, timing of things, scale, intensity, the amount of force, the frequency. When you're thinking about choosing a tool, think about how it fits into this. So I wanna walk through this really quick. So again, frequency, the number of times a tool or practice is used, intensity, the amount of force needed, Scale, the volume, concentration, or type. Timing, when is it most effective and or least destructive? All right, so we're going to lay this out in a matrix. What we've got here is we've got to look at the trade-offs, lay out the trade-offs, and what's my recovery or recarbonization plan to utilizing the various tools that we've got. So I got a weed problem. I can choose a tool that's going to involve tillage. So when I choose that tool, what are the carbon trade-offs, the carbonomics? What are the positives and what are the negatives according to the frequency, intensity, scale, and timing of choosing to use that tool? So what I've got here is frequency. Positives, it may prevent, if I do you know, a deep tillage tool, instead of a shallow tillage tool to get rid of this particular weed that I have, it may prevent me from having to go out there and till it a bunch of times. 
I can reduce the number of tillage passes I need to do. And that's important because every time you do a tillage pass, you are potentially killing directly microbes and or destroying their habitat. And especially when it comes to things like soil fungi and mycorrhizal fungi. And when it comes to mycorrhizal fungi, you do tillage, basically that's like ripping off a limb, potentially, and destroying my home. And if you just do that once, I could be okay, because yeah, you ripped off my limb, but I can regrow that limb, and I could still do my job throughout the season. But if you have to do tillage multiple times throughout the growing season, you're ripping off limbs and destroying my home, and all that I'm doing is regrowing limbs and rebuilding my house, and I'm not doing my job to help with nutrient cycling and nutrient flow. Talked about yesterday with the nitrogen and phosphorus moving between the legume and the non-legume plant. I can't do that, because all of my resources are in regrowing myself and building my house again. So thinking about the frequency. If I do a deep tillage, that is going to be of a greater level of intensity. Speed of the tractor, that amount of force that you have there. It may be more effective, but it also may or may not be more destructive. Yep. So what we're looking at is, again, looking at all of these from the perspective of positives and negatives according to what these tools do. Now I think, I've been trying to think this out for a while, I don't know for sure if this is gonna help you or not, but my inclination is, is this may be a way to help you in choosing amongst all of the plethora of these tools that you could have to deal with this issue. So we've got tillage as something you can do. Chemicals, so we did physical, mechanical tools that you could have. We've got a chemical tool you could use, some sort of pesticide. What are the positives and negatives of that if you have to do it more frequent or less frequent? Is that positive or negative? The amount of force or the type of chemical that you're using, how is that gonna impact that? Sorry, the amount of force that's involved in that, how devastating is that? If you use an insecticide, is that gonna kill all of the insects? including all of the beneficials and all of the microscopic insects as well as the macroscopic insects? Scale. Do we have, what tools should I use here? What types of chemicals? Are there new things that I could try that may help me to reduce the amount that's needed? Or are the new combinations of things going to cause something worse to happen? Thinking about the consequences of these tools. Cropping, again, every tool that you choose, every issue that you have when you're trying to identify the tools, there are mechanical or physical, chemical and biological tools that can be used to address that. So we can use cropping, intercropping, companion cropping, cover cropping, polycropping, whatever type that you're trying to do, what are the positives and negatives of using that tool? When you can use something like grazing, haying, or mowing as another biological tool or mechanical tool that's out there. Again, I said, I want to do soil disturbance. If I can do it with an animal, why would I do it with a plow? Maybe I do want to use the plow. Maybe there is a reason that I do that. But I need to think through all of these potential options that I could have. What are the impacts on my labor force? Can I time that around reducing the impacts on my labor force, making that positive or negative? All of these things that we can put into place. And then you want to have a recovery plan. So for tillage, I want to offset the soil carbon and soil structure losses, the negative impacts. If I use herbicides, I want to offset the soil carbon and soil structure losses and negative impacts. We know that herbicides were how we created runways in Southeast Asia. They can make the soil incredibly hard. 
So how do we offset that soil structure impact that you have? We know that adding fertilizers is now acidifying our soils. How can we offset that by increasing the carbon buffer in our system? Cropping, assessing plant species and impacts on nutrient cycling, water use, including crop stressors and weed pressures and respond with grazing or enhancing plant diversity. One of the other things, and this is sort of, I've got just <laughs> a couple more points <laughs> that I want to point out here, because grazing is the last one that, that I want to show, but the one I want to point out with a cropping, we've talked some about carbon and nitrogen ratio. And we need to be looking a lot more at carbon to nitrogen ratio in our systems. And Rick talked about this with his foxtail issue, but I think there's an even more important consideration to be talking about carbon to nitrogen ratio when it is that we get our soils having too much nitrogen. So when we get a carbon to nitrogen ratio that is about 15 to one, um, so as it starts to drop between 20 to one, getting into the 15 to one type of ratio in our soil, what ends up happening is if you add a cover crop that has a legume in it, you're not going to get nitrogen fixation. Because nitrogen, unless it's in an inorganic form, nitrogen in the soil, like most of the nutrients, is toxic to all life, including the microorganisms. And they are not going to want to live in a toxic environment when the nitrate concentrations are too high in the soil. So when you get a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's around 15 to 1, you're getting too high of a concentration of nitrogen. That's the concentration of carbon to nitrogen. There's too much nitrogen in that system that if you add a legume in there, you're not going to get nitrogen fixation. Just because you put a legume in there doesn't mean automatically that you're going to get nitrogen fixation. The microbe has to have a reason to do that and the plant is telling it if that reason exists based on the sugars that it gives it. And if the levels are too toxic for it, it will not do it. It's part of the outsourcing of the jobs as well. When there's too high of a concentration of the nutrients in their inorganic forms in the soil, those inorganic forms of nutrients are the things that are toxic to all life. So we want to be considering how it is that we can balance out what we might need to add for fertility and what the soil, the plant, and the microbiology need. And I'm going to throw out a word that I want you all to start investigating. So go on, go on your, your, your phone machines and your, your, your computer machines and all of those types of things. And look up Dr. James White. He's out of um, Rutgers University. And he's doing research on what's called rhizophagy. And this is where he is seeing that the plant's roots are able to absorb bacteria and essentially harvest the nutrients from the bacteria that are absorbed. And then once they're done harvesting, they kick those bacteria back out into the rhizosphere so that they can absorb more nutrients and get reabsorbed into the plant roots. So that we're not looking at always addressing, we've learned so much on the fact that what the plant needs is not always these inorganic nutrients but nutrients that are coming from the biology. And in some case, the biology, the organisms in and of themselves. Grazing, as I said, grazing can be a termination tool. It can be a disturbance tool. You can do mowing, you can do haying, you can cut the plant off, you can terminate a weed, you can terminate a crop, you could terminate alfalfa. Grazing and timing of the overgrazing, the plant, the animal is a tool. It can be destructive and it can be enhancing. Sometimes you want it to be destructive. Use it to be destructive. If that's what it is that you need to do, I need to terminate alfalfa. I'm going to do that by how I graze. We can manage these things with biological tools first over the chemical and physical tools 
that we have in our systems. And so with that, I hope that that can help you to one, start taking a look at your soil. And I will share with Cindy and the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition protocol for making these sieves and measuring aggregate stability. And um, I will also, you know, hope that you will use some of this information as some decision-making tools as you go along your regenerative path. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. <laughs> More ways to make decisions, hopefully that affect not only your soil health and, and function, but profitability as well. So thank you, Dr. Nichols. Thank you.